This time I'll be discussing two very closely related fallacies. Not similar, mind you, but related. Consider first the common tactic of both creationists and Holocaust deniers. Show me one piece of evidence that the Holocaust actually happened. Show me one piece of evidence that evolution happens. The problem here is that one piece of evidence is not enough to demonstrate anything. Consider what single piece of evidence demonstrates that gravity exists, or that the Revolutionary War happened. This is called the snapshot fallacy. The existence of any scientific phenomenon, the occurrence of any historical event, is established by a convergence of evidence. Of course, I must now explain. What if we already know that if A is true, then B will turn orange? What can we do with this knowledge? How can we use it? Well, if at some point we are in a position to observe A, but not B, and we see that A is true, we can predict that if at some point B is observed, it will probably be orange. But what if B is observable, and A is not? If we are able to observe B, and we see that it is orange, can we conclude from this that A is true? Unfortunately, no. This is another logical fallacy known sometimes as affirming the antecedent, other, other times as affirming the consequent. The logical problem with this fallacy is that it gets the premise and the conclusion in the wrong order. The scientific problem is that it fails to account for the possibility of an extraneous cause. Maybe B is orange because of some other factor we don't yet know about or simply overlooked. A being true makes B orange, but B being orange does not establish that A is true. By the same token, A not being true does not prevent B from being orange. But if A being true establishes that B is orange, then B not being, true, being orange demonstrates that A is not true. What is called for here is an act of inductive reasoning instead of deductive. The difference is that deductive reasoning concerns itself with validity. Either the supported propositions, also known as conclusions, follow from the supporting propositions, also known as premises, or they don't. Either the deductive ar argument is valid or it isn't. Inductive arguments are different, though. Consider. <clears throat> Most lawyers are conservative. Such and so is a lawyer. Such and so is most likely conservative. The difference here is that the conclusion might be changed in the event of the discovery of additional inductive premises. For example, Most lawyers associated with the ACLU are liberal. Such and so is associated with the ACLU. Such and so is probably liberal. Do you see, do you see how that works? Any historical event or scientific phenomenon is an inductive conclusion. It's established on the basis of a currently available body of evidence which is always subject to expansion. So from the outset, a much longer list of testing criteria must be reasoned out. If A is true, B will turn orange, C will turn backwards, D will invert, E will turn inside out, F will turn into G, and H will disappear. Now, we're ready to test the firmness of this possibility. Now, if at some point we're in a position to observe B, and we see that indeed it is orange, then this suggests that A is true. So then we take steps to examine the status of C, and if we find that indeed it is backwards, this strengthens the suggestion that A is true, making it more likely. Then we check D, and if we find that it is indeed upside down, then further, in, further investigation shows us that E is inside out, F and H are no longer visible, but G is, where before it wasn't, then A is established as overwhelmingly likely to be true. The odds at this point that A is otherwise are so small that the act of fixating on them becomes unreasonable. So how do we know that the Revolutionary War happened? Well, for one thing, we have volumes of first-hand records from a litany of different sources chronicling it, indeed examining it battle by battle. For another, we have hundreds of letters written by soldiers fighting in that war sent to friends and family, the details of which place them precisely where troop manifests and duty rosters say they should be. For yet another, we have those troop manifests and duty rosters. The only reasonable explanation is that this war did happen. Now, one could allege that all this evidence is just a forgery. But such widespread collusion would require the most meticulous, precise cooperation among hundreds of thousands of people. For all of them to go along with it continuously for the years of effort required would require a means to keep them all motivated, resolute, and focused to that end. Any misstep would leave evidence. Every misstep would leave corroborating, converging evidence. And the more people who are in on a secret, the harder it is to keep. 
So this particular explanation is really not reasonable, nor tenable. Now, how do we know that gravity exists? Can we observe it? No. But we can observe and study and, if, and eventually predict its effects. We can predict that if I, if I let go of this pen right now, it will fall. But more than that, we can predict how far it will fall, how long it will take to reach the floor, at what, and what speed it will reach. We can even predict the conversion of kinetic energy into acoustic energy, in other words, the sound it will make on impact. We are able to do all of this because of how much we understand about this force, so yet again, denying this force's existence is really not reasonable. Now, how do we know that the Holocaust took place? Well, few people in the world are as meticulous at keeping records as the Germans, and as a result, one piece of evidence is Germany's own census records. The Jewish demographic is more than six million lower after the Second World War than before the rise of the Third Reich. Now, this is not information from just one report. This is a comparison between reports, adding up information from hundreds of other reports from all across Germany. The Jewish part of the German populace decreased by more than six million in that time. If they didn't die in the Holocaust, where did they go? Figure into this the abundant anti-Semitic sentiment which pervaded all parts of Europe at the time. The documented rise in anti-Semitic hate crime, the hate speech saturating the private correspondence between Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, Eichmann, and hundreds of other Nazi officers and officials, the reconnaissance photos from Allied planes flying over the camps showing masses of people being marched from one building to the next, out of formation, the records including the execution records from those camps, the remaining memorial museums of the gas chambers and ovens used, the documentation after VE Day of all the gas chambers with their walls stained blue coinciding with the use of Zyklon B gas, the footage of the mass graves, the countless Allied soldiers involved in the liberation of the concentration camps, including General Eisenhower himself, testifying to the mass graves, starvation, and squalor therein, and the numerous Nazi officers on trial at Nuremberg consistently denying that the Holocaust was wrong, but never actually denying that it happened. And the only wide-sweeping, unifying, all-inclusive explanation of all of this is that the Holocaust did indeed happen. No other explanation accomplishes this without relying on a list of warrantless assumptions. Now, before I continue to the next example, one Holocaust denial observation is that one of the gas chambers, though I don't recall which, has a door which does not lock, and so this would seem to raise doubts about whether it could have been used as a gas chamber. Indeed, this would raise serious doubts if the Holocaust were just last month or last year, but no. It was more than six decades ago, and after VE Day, this particular gas chamber was converted into a memorial museum. As a result, this odd detail is an anomaly which calls for an explanation, but one is available. Anyone in this museum's staff will be glad to explain this. You see, this museum has been in operation for a few decades, and so its various doors have been in use all that time, being opened and closed anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred times per day. As a result, this one in particular has worn out and been replaced a few times. This door, which does not lock, is not the original. Another common Holocaust denial observation is that a brick taken from one gas chamber and tested at a chemistry laboratory showed no signs of Zyklon B gas. But consider, under what circumstances would one be in a position to remove a brick from a gas chamber? The chamber in question was reduced to rubble decades before the sample was removed exposing the inner walls of the chamber to the elements. This has left ample time for wind, snow, melting snow, and rain to wash away all Zyklon B residue. The door doesn't lock, therefore the room could not have been used as a gas chamber, and the sample shows no, chase, no trace of Zyklon B gas, therefore it could not have been used, are both examples of the snapshot fallacy, in that each attempts to establish a wide-sweeping, far-reaching conclusion on grossly inadequate grounds. These are each curious observations, the like of which call for explanations, but perfectly reasonable, perfectly adequate explanations are available that stop far short of necessitating throwing out the Holocaust or establishing a conspiracy theory in its place.